All right, so into the match, we have Edmund Chu here versus Din. We have the list in front of us. There are some particular, there's some particular interesting additions to these lists for the Ruby Amethyst list. From what we have, it does look like the Ruby Amethyst player has the addition of two uninkable eight-cost ceases in the deck. Very atypical. Also, the eight one-drops. Just to remind you, we did talk about the eight one-drops versus the four. There is a big deck-building split in the Ruby Amethyst community for running four eight drop four one drops versus eight one drops the eight one drops um the math on that does increase <laughs> your chances to find a one drop if you are sculpting your hand quite aggressively for it brings it up to around 80 to 90 percent while previous to that it is somewhere around 70 to find that maybe slightly below so this one drop into two drop flynn into three drop sisu is one of the best early game curves that the Ruby Amethyst deck can have, especially against Ruby Sapphire. Ruby Sapphire in the previous set, in the previous metagame, was actually very favored against Ruby Amethyst, but with the addition of this new Flynn Rider, as well as the Sisu, Ruby Amethyst is now extremely favored against Ruby Sapphire. Ruby Sapphire, as a response, has started to tech cards for Ruby Amethyst. Specifically, it's why we see the new Hercules come in, the five-cost uninkable 7-3 as a way to deal with locations. Ruby Sapphire is a particularly hard time dealing with locations, especially the Queen's Cat so it is a very interesting matchup right now. It is not unwinnable for Ruby Sapphire, but it, it went from it's very interesting how it went from an extremely good matchup in the previous set to now probably Ruby Sapphire's worst matchup. Yeah, I think it's going to be pretty important, especially since Edmund is going to be on the play, being the higher seed. He has the opportunity to get this Flynn Rider Sisu Castle line out before Din can really respond and. It's interesting to see the ways that Ruby Sapphire lists have been teching towards this. We even see a Queen of Hearts in Din's um, deck list being played just to be able to have a card you can play on turn two to shut off the Flynn for one turn, uh, but it's uh, disrupting a lot of what you want to do in Ruby Sapphire anyway. So why is the Queen's Castle so good against Ruby Sapphire? A lot of that comes from it having seven willpower. The Maui cannot clear it in one turn, and then you pass back to the Ruby Amethyst player who can either get rid of said Maui or play something like a board sweeper. It really is that seven willpower. So also the Queen of Hearts, in conjunction with Maui, can help you clear that Queen's Castle. We have also have access to Hercules, which is the new tech addition to the deck to try to deal with that location is particularly troublesome for the current iterations of Ruby Sapphire to deal with. And I'm, I would not be surprised if we see that this game. Yeah, we're already off to the races here. Edmund having played a uh, Magic Broom on turn one, being able to quest with it, gain a lore, then play a Trinobox Followers afterwards to banish it, draw a card, and then have this Trinobox Followers that Edmund will be able to quest with and banish if he wants to on the next turn to draw yeah. a card as well. So Ruby Sapphire wants to do one thing very specifically every single game on turn two. Doesn't matter if you're on the draw, doesn't matter if you're on the play, and that is play one jump ahead. The one jump ahead is one of the most impactful things this deck can do, and if you actually look at the curve of the Ruby Sapphire deck, it tends to go one, two, four because that two cost uh, ramp card is so important and actually will skip the three sort of the three ink plays for the most part because it accelerates straight up to four. And a lot of its very impactful cards do exist at four in the form of Grandma Tala here in Flaversham, How Far I'll Go and such things like that. But now we are over to turn four, and it, there is that Grammatal we talked about. We're going to look at two cards. One goes into the hand, one goes to the bottom, not to be confused with how far I'll go, which will put one card exerted into the inkwell and one into the hand. How Far I'll Go is another great follow-up to a card like Grandma Tala as well, doing those things like you mentioned that Sapphire wants to do, especially early in the game, of ramping, but also putting cards into your hands so that you have more answers, you also have more things to ink, if we can get something like a Fishbone qu Quill down so that you're not diminishing your hand too far. Grandma Tala is also one of the better answers to Flynn by itself, so because you will be playing one jump head on turn two, and you go into turn four, and you can actually play that Grandma Tala to turn off the Flynn. One of the more disastrous things is when the Flynn comes out, maybe the Sisu isn't the follow-up, and all you have to answer is maybe a turn five play, maybe you have a hero on, on the battlefield, and there's really not, you know, you're triggering maybe three to six lore, and that's a lot for Ruby Amethyst to get ahead on. Ruby Amethyst is a deck that gets up to critical maximums of lore in the, you know, 14, 15, 16 range, and they can close out the game via these goats and bouncing those goats back to hand. And speaking of bouncing, we see the Merlin Rabbit being played by Edmund in the previous turn. I believe there's some bounce cards in Edmund's hand too, and I feel like Ruby Amethyst is great at doing this. Knowing that you're playing against a deck that has a very great late game, you want to be playing characters, questing with them, and then keeping them safe, especially your rabbits and your goats, by bouncing them back to him, getting the uh, most value that you can out of them. Yeah, and speaking of, we see Vitalisphere hit 
the field for Din here. This is a newer addition to Ruby Sapphire. It has been in the deck in the past, but it is partly in there. Okay, firstly, it's in there because it's a one-cost item. Harem can hit it. You can draw two cards. But it does help you in desperate scenarios to deal with that Queen's Castle. It's not ideal, right? It doesn't draw an additional card. You have to get rid of this card in order to, tri to trigger that effect. But it is something. The Queen's Castle is often a must-answer card, and you're willing to play pretty much anything and everything that you can fit in your deck to help deal with that because it's the hardest card for Ruby Sapphire to deal with in Ruby Amethyst, particularly at this turn. Tournament, or specifically this tournament, was the most played deck in the room. It also creates some interesting lines where if you have a Tomatoa and a Vitalisphere is in your discard, say you banished it with Hiram to draw some extra cards, if you have the ink for it, you can actually play a Tomatoa, then banish the Vitalisphere, and that's just enough strength on the Tomatoa to rush into a Queen's Castle. We talked about how important that card can be for the Ruby Amethyst player. Absolutely. Like, the Ruby Sapphire deck, looking at set championships, looking at Baham, was struggling a lot versus this Ruby Sapphire list, in or Ruby Amethyst list in particular, and it was actually a reason to not play the deck. And I think a lot of Ruby Sapphire players realized that they had good matchups into pretty much everything except Ruby Amethyst, and it's a good reason to potentially not play the deck, because if it's going to be the most played deck, that's a great reason to be, maybe I should pick something else. But what it came down to is a lot of the deck builders in Ruby Sapphire asked themselves the question, can we tweak the deck in a way that we can increase our efficacy to win the Ruby Am Amethyst matchup while keeping our other good matchups. And that's why you see cards like Hercules, Vitalisphere, and some of these other tech pieces make it into the list. Yeah, that's why there's something interesting with Din's list and that you're not playing the Icebox, you're not playing the CCs anymore. Those were staples in this list for other matchups as well. So it's interesting to see how Din has been able to adapt to this. And I feel like we're reaching a point in this game where tides are starting to shift. The Ruby Sapphire player is starting to get a bunch of ink in the inkwell. We saw it be prepared, played earlier to clear the what Ed has been doing. Edmund's been doing a great job, though, of not overextending, bouncing characters back into their hand, being able to replay cards like Rabbit, get value out of them, and just slowly creep up in lore. And Ruby Sapphire is a, I mean, the Sisu in Ruby Sapphire is a particularly good card, but the reason it's made its way out of the list in conjunction with the Ice Blocks, which are also great cards, is because you have to ask yourself, how many uninkables can I afford to play? More than normal, of course, because you have access to Fishbone Quill. Nevertheless, there is a, <laughs> there is an amount in which you have to sort of cut back and that's why we've seen that top end sort of removed in order to to make room for some of these lower these lower cost characters and some of these lower curve um, items that allow you to deal with locations a bit more. But anyway, back to the game, we did have the Madame Medusa hit that that here in Flavisham. That is a critical uh, engine for our Ruby Sapphire player. It is part of the core draw engine. It is a great target for Madame Medusa. Also, we saw the Lucky Dime come down on Din, and this is a really interesting board state, in my opinion, because Ruby Sapphire, or sorry, Ruby Amethyst, don't have any cards that interact with items. So as soon as this Lucky Dime is in play, as, as long as Din can uh, land a character card with a decent amount of lore, every single turn I expect Din to be using this Lucky Dime, gaining a little bit of extra lore, and this is where Ruby Sapphire can jump from a very low lore uh, total up to 20 in just a couple turns. Yeah, you're absolutely correct. Ruby Amethyst has absolutely zero way to deal with opposing items, and that dime represents a huge threat on the field. If we see something like a Tamatoa come down, we could see Din able to sort of take... Uh, take this game from a what would be like a five to six turn clock to a tur two turn clock very, very quickly, even though Din is only at two lore. Ruby Sapphire can close the gap very, very quickly with this Lucky Dime and this Tamatoa combo. Yeah, especially with all the items that we already see with uh, on Din's side of the board, four items total. That means the Tamatoa would have five lore on total. And we see Edmund doing his best, just trying to play cards, get some value out of them, questing them, getting closer and closer to 20, going up to 11. Edmund has a ton of cards in hand, so just trying not to overextend into something like a Be Prepared uh, so that he can maybe get to 20 before... Din finds a Tomatoa, but we do see a Tomatoa in hand currently. Yeah, look at that grip that Edmund has. That is so many cards in hand to have at this point. So the one thing that happens is as a Ruby Amethyst player, once you get to those higher amounts of lore, whether it's over 10 or you're closing in on 15, it's it's really hard for your opponent to stop you, not only because the goat bounce, but just if your characters quest once, if they just get the pip value that is in the bottom right, that is simply progressing your win condition so much mm -hmm. that it's so hard to deal with. And if you had really that comes down to card advantage and attrition, right? You're willing that you can put your characters on the field, get the singular quest value out of them, and that is just going to be enough. And your opponent will just not have enough removal to actually get them off of the board before they get that that one or two lore that is printed on the bottom right there. Right, we just see a goat being uh, 
drawn off the top of the deck. There's also a couple of Queen's Castles in there, so you know, not even characters, but if Edmund is able to land to be prepared or forced in to play a be prepared, then follow up with some castles. We're in an interesting state because of those two Vitalispheres that Din has on his side of the board. Previously in this matchup where the Queen's Castles might put in a lot of work, we've reached a point in the late game where the castles may not stick, or maybe you want to play them, forcing Din to have to react. Absolutely. So that that be prepared castle line in particular is an eleven ink, is an eleven ink play, and Edmund is at uh, eight ink currently. Also, if we want to talk about some of the goat lines, goat bounce goat, which is a three lore play, is a ten ink play, assuming that you have the goat and the uh, Madame Mim snakes in hand. It goes up to eleven if you have to replace that with a fox. But these are these are values that all Ruby Sapphire players sitting across from Ruby and this player that they have in mind. That's not, that's why they know that they actually need to slow them down long before they get to that 17, 18 um, lore value. Yeah, I mean, even just a couple of turns ago, Edmund was only around 8 lore, maybe creeping up on 11. We see as the as the game goes on, he's inching closer and closer to that 20 lore count. But I feel like we're actually, we're still in a race here with Tomato on board and the Dime. It may look like there's a large lore disparity, but... Edmund's at seven. The Tamatoa and Dime on board could quest for 10 total next turn if you wanted to, jumping him all the way up to 17. Din doesn't need that much more before he can steal the game away. Both players are actually presenting two turn clocks in this scenario, and this game is actually extremely close. I would say I would feel pretty uncomfortable being Edmund in this position, and I would actually think that I would be pressured to remove that Tamatoa. I feel like, to an extent, like you're asking yourself the question, should I even, should I three for one myself, or four for one myself, <laughs> and, and go ahead and be prepped this Tamatoa? Because you can't can't let that Tamatoa get 10, 10 lore, right? If you do, the next thing that hits the field is just going to get dimed and potentially close the game. That could be uh, multiple threats, to be honest. It could be anything like, you know, two questers like Judy Hops, but also another Tamatoa hitting, and that could just represent games. So you have to ask yourself a question. Do I have to remove this Tamatoa? when it's the only thing on the field, and maybe the only thing I have to remove it is a beat prepared. Yeah, I'm sure Edmund wishes that he had a Lady Tremaine or a Bee King Undisputed, you know, cards that we see pretty regularly in Ruby Amethyst decks. Um, but the scariest thing for me as a Ruby Amethyst player is we are going to remove the Tomatoa, and Dean could just have another Tomatoa that you could play the next turn. You know, it feels like they're always there. Also, keep in mind, Edmund just four for one himself. I mean, that is an inherently poor exchange, but you are just in that board set. Also, Edmund has built his deck in a way that Tomatoa who is a very strong threat, doesn't have B-King Undisputed, doesn't have Lady Tremaine, which I, by the way, I love that deck building decision. I love the decision to play the, what is the, sometimes the more universal and objectively better cards in the form of Madame Medusa, potentially as Eka Sisu, and open yourself up to being weak to Tamatoa, but just saying, I have better coverage over the entire metagame rather than having better coverage over this small portion, which might be the Ruby Sapphire players. But in that, extrapolating from that, we do see Edmund actually go for a four for one on the, uh, on the negative side of that and have to be prep the board with Tamatoa to stop that 10 that ten quest. And in response, we see Din playing a great stone dragon, a tech card that I really loved. It sort of, it doesn't counter a be prepared, but playing into a ruby matchup where you know there's going to be a bunch of your characters in your discard pile, great stone dragon allows you to take those characters from your discard pile then put them into your inkwell exerted, sort of getting more use out of them than you initially did. <laughs> yeah, double goat does hit the field for Edmund and the writing is on the wall. And I think we're going to see, you know, as this game potentially comes to a close, that that be prepared play was the act the correct play to lose three of your characters and one of your cars to exchange for that singular Tamatoa because you have to slow Din down. You know this is Din's win condition. Din's win condition is absolutely not putting a Gramatala down and Lucky Diamond that. <laughs> and you know you have goats in hand, so you realize that you're the beat down. And because you have so much card advantage as the Ruby, the Ruby Amethyst player, and we go ahead and scoop them up. Wow, what a game. I feel like we watched Ruby Amethyst do sort of what it does best. We didn't exactly see that Flint. Yeah, Ruby Amethyst versus Ruby Sapphire is one of my favorite matchups in the metagame. And it's particularly interesting if we've seen these Ruby Sapphire list tech to actually try to get more equity into the Ruby Amethyst matchup. Interested to see if we do see that Flynn Sisu potentially come out. Do you see Flynn in hand for Edmund? Obviously, Edmund, Edmund is on the draw, which is makes that line a, a lot worse. Not not terrible, but a lot worse than it would be on the play. Flynn Sisu Castle is probably one of the strongest on the play things you can do in Larkana outside of Bucky, um, sorry, Diablo Bucky Diablo. 
And we do see Din t uh, altering a, his complete hand, seven cards back, drawing seven cards again. So I don't think he found what he was looking for in that opener. Yeah, so some of the things you're looking for as the Ruby Sapphire player are ideally one cost item, ideally Flavisham to do that turn four draw. Maybe you want to back out Brawl for the Flynn just in case, but you really need that one jump ahead. And I think a lot of Ruby Sapphire players swear by having one jump ahead on two. And the deck is really built around it. Like if you look at the deck, it has foregone the three cost ink characters to actually just skip that and go to four because it, it it looks to find this one jump ahead this two cost ramp so consistently we do have the popsicle on one gonna go ahead and draw a card i see the one jump ahead in hand as well so we're gonna accelerate to four resources then once we get to four we're gonna play the gramatal and then the gramatal will sing that how far i'll go it's kind of a perfect curve here yeah pretty great opening hand for din we do see a trend box follower being played by edmund just starting this uh this slow lore gain of being able to quest for one potentially drawing a card after that oh by the way we had a very interesting ink decision from Din there. So Din actually uh, topped, you know, drew the Popsicle, I believe, had the Gramatal. Gramatal is the ideal turn four play here, but doesn't have another inkable. Everything is uninkable, so he had to make the decision to actually ink the Popsicle to keep the Gramatal. And I, I believe actually needs to find an inkable off the top here in order to play the Gramatal on turn four. So goes ahead and they find the Fishbone Quill. There we go. And there's our Gramatal. Our Gramatal is also going to sing that How Far I Go. It looks like we see another Popsicle off the top, as well as a Lucky Dime in the back there. Surely Lucky Dime will be going to the bottom. Gramatal just in time, too, with the Flynn Rider coming down, shutting off Flynn Rider's ability, which would give Edmund an extra three lore at the start of his turn if he has a character with more strength uh, than his opponent's characters. So Gramatal is serving a lot of roles here, being able to help Din sing How Far I'll Go to ramp on this next turn, and also shutting off the Flynn. All right, so into turn three here for Edmund. We do have a Maleficent Sorceress. Going to go ahead and draw that card, replace itself. Gramatala and the Popsicle are in hand. We're going to sing how far I'll go. We're going to look at two. One of these will go into the inkwell. One, one will go into hand. I saw a Brawl as one of those cards. That's going to go exerted. So back over, it looks like we have kept the Brawl. We have another Gramatala as well as a Popsicle in hand. Going to lead off with that Gramatala. Look at another two cards. I think this is exactly what the Ruby Sapphire deck wants to be doing, just putting cards into the inkwell, drawing extra cards so that you can find those answers that you're trying to ramp up to. Absolutely, and is able to play that other popsicle draw card. By the way, if you, you should really pay attention to Din's sequencing. Din sequences everything perfectly and gets as much information as possible before doing, doing something like inking a card for the turn. It's always objectively correct to look at as many cards as possible before you, you make that decision. We do see Edmund just inking and playing a Merlin Rabbit for turn, drawing an extra card. Another How Far I Go. We start to see the power of Man. How Far I Go. How Far I Go is a, a card that is often cut down from four to three in some of these lists because I feel like the power level of it is so innocuous. It's not easy to evaluate how much oh my impact gosh. it can have on the game until you see something like this where it is just an absolute, it is absolutely incredible. I feel like it being a song especially, being able to sing it for free and then ramp and then draw a card on top of it. I mean, th having three of them now, Din has put three extra ink into his inkwell just from these cards alone. Yeah, ramp is very very powerful in Larkana because what it fundamentally comes down to is a lot of these cards are balanced off of being able to come into the game at a certain turn and ramp breaks that paradigm you're able to accelerate them out out far before they're supposed to be um, on the field we do see Din playing a brawl on that Merlin rabbit not wanting Edmund to get any value out of it or more than he already will yeah, it's an, it's an attrition, it's sort of an attrition thing. Doesn't want Edmund to actually bounce that back and play the longer game against him because sometimes Ruby Amethyst, when it has answers for Flaversham, can have a better draw package in the form of Merlin Rabbit plus bounce. We do see a Maui being played to banish the Grimatala as well, trying to take down Din's board a little bit, the Ruby Amethyst player being put in a bit more of a reactionary role versus what we saw last game. Which is not really where you want to be. So Ruby Amethyst can actually out-control Ruby Sapphire sometimes. I would say it's the exception and not the example. Um, Ruby Sapphire is, in general, a much better control deck. That being said, if, you a if you're able to hit all of the Flavoshams and you're able to stop all of the Tamatoas... <laughs> And now we start to see the power level of this card. How far, oh <laughs> how far ago being a somewhat recent addition to the list, not in this set, but the last set, was not in some, a lot of the original ramp lists. And once it made it in, it, it just feels like an absolute staple at this point. We're starting to see why. 
I mean, this is just insane. Uh, Edmund only has five ink in his ink well, and I think Dan has ten or more at this point, opening up all of the lines that Ruby Sapphire has outside of super expensive ones like Lucky Diamond and Tomatoa, but we see the Lucky Diamond being played now, and at this point, any character that gets played that has two or more lore can be a threat, and as we mentioned last game, Edmund doesn't have any way to interact with this Lucky Dime, so Edmund's on a clock. Absolutely. Once the Lucky Diamond hits, you, as a Ruby Amethyst player, you absolutely feel the pressure because it is. we are now in a race scenario, and the Ruby Sapphire deck does have a somewhat level of inevitability to win the game. Looks like Dan is passing the turn over to Edmund, and the Flynn trigger will go off because of the Maui having six strength, being the character with most strength on the board. Yeah, Maui plus Finn is a is a very powerful combination. We are back over to Edmund's turn here. We do see the Queen's Castle in hand. Queen's Castle often better against an empty board than something that has Gramatala on it. But still a relevant pot potential play here. Also has access to another Maui to clean up that board and kind of win sort of this uh this board pretty easily, right? Yeah, imagine we're looking to get rid of this Hiram Flaversham if we can this turn. Just the amount of power that you have through that card, drawing then further and further into his deck, usually two or three cards a turn. Honestly, I think one of the heuristics, if you were to sort of look at the, the macro data of every Ruby Sapphire and uh, Ruby Amethyst matchup would be how many times did they activate Flaversham outside of the original quest. And I think you could probably, if, if, <laughs> if it was more than four, or if it was, <laughs> it would be, uh, I think that the Ruby Sapphire player would be very, very favorite. It is a top priority card to actually um, go ahead and banish. And now we've set up an interesting board here where Edmund has, is the only player yeah. with characters on the board, and we do see a Be Prepared come down. Don't want that Flynn gaining the extra lore off of those Mauis sitting there, basically mm -hmm. uh, resetting the board state. Yeah, I still think that Din is extremely favored in this position. That being said, Edmund can drop something like a castle, and Din, if, if they do not have the correct answers, can be in a pretty bad position. We also see the Merlin Rabbit, so we can start that draw engine package of the Ruby Amethyst player here. That Lucky Dime, though, with so much lore is just such a threat. It is such a win condition to deal with as the Ruby Amethyst player, and you have to you have to pivot away from the controlling aspect and start to, you know, start to become the beatdown because you just will not win the long game against the Lucky Dime. I feel like at this point, you can't really be scared as the Ruby Amethyst player. The Ruby Sapphire player has a ton of ink. They've drawn a bunch of cards. They're likely to have answers, and so I feel like at this point, you just sort of need to try to pull as many of those answers out as you can, get as much lore as you can, try to get to 15 or 16 ink, and maybe you can land uh, goats. We haven't seen very many of them in the game so far. Just find a way to get up to 20 before these larger characters like Tamatoa end up being played. But we do see another Hiram Flaversham uh, coming into play, drawing more cards. And there's a developer brain as well. We'll look at the top two. Oh, that was... Uh yeah, <laughs> almost made a mistake there, putting it into the inkwell instead of the bottom of the deck. Yep, so <laughs> that is a very common, uh, very common thing that happens. People will get it mixed up at, with how far I'll go, and they'll get the other one mixed up as well. How far I'll go, they will put that card uh, on the bottom on sometimes. It can be difficult. There's three cards total in the Ruby Sapphire deck that does some variation of that. Uh, so luckily, you've caught pretty quickly, but it looks like we're going to play Vitalisphere to help... T uh, prepare ourselves in case there is a queen's castle that does come down into a relatively weak board regarding strength for a din yeah honestly going all in on a queen's castle here could be the correct decision it became less of a dis the correct decision as vitalisphere uh is now on the field but uh, if din does not have an answer to a to a queen's castle and you start getting draw triggers off that could be in a really really good position that being said, we do see that he does have that. <laughs> we do see the Sisu being played, removing the Hiram Flaversham, and is immediately uh, responded to with a be another Be Prepared by Din, banishing that. You don't want Edmund gaining the three lore off of Sisu for that next turn. Yeah, and Edmund's list is particularly weak to Tomatoa because it doesn't have access to the Tr Tremaine or Beaking Undisputed. Has to be prepped every single time, so it's something to keep in mind as we move into the late stages of this game. That even a Tamatoa, even on an empty board and with no other characters insulating around it to stop those Lady Tremaine esque effects, is still very, very powerful against Edmund's deck in particular because it has opted to not include some of those Ruby Amethyst staples. I think you're completely right. We see M Edmund playing a Flynn Rider and a Snake, just forcing Din to have another answer to threats that Edmund continues to play. Madame Medusa is the response on the Snake and not the Flynn Rider. 
Yep, because I think because we have some redundant cars that could potentially hit the Flynn Rider. Also, you know, after seeing two Mauis, I'm not sure that we're worried about a character coming down that has more than four strength as well. Um, also, we know that Dan also has a backup Be Prepared currently in hand. We see the Rabbit. That might be the third or fourth Rabbit. And we see Be Prepared come off the top for Edmund. Another Rabbit in hand, and I believe that is the fourth Rabbit. But they could have been bounced back and forth many, many times. That is what this Ruby Amethyst deck does in order to totally draw cards. Is that, you know, the draw engine in set one was actually the um, the magic mirror, which is really funny. Yes. It's a four cost. <laughs> uh, it's a two cost unnakable card that you know you can pay four and tap it every turn to draw cards. And that quickly made its way out of the list as this Mad Man <laughs> package came into the game. That's yeah, just a little too <laughs> slow for uh, what we have now with the Merlin Rabbits, and it gets hard to keep up with them as they bounce them over and over. So one of like the 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 universal paradigms of TCGs is if you can find a card with a downside, and you could turn that downside into an upside. And the, these Mad Mims, those are looked at like as downsides. These are overstatic characters, but you will see the, Ruby, with the, the way the Ruby Amethyst deck utilizes them is often an upside, actually. Yeah, especially paired with the rabbits and the goats. We saw Edmund drawing a goat off the top. Might be useful later in the game to push him over the edge. Looks like we're thinking about inking a Queen's Castle here from Edmund. So while I do think that, Ed, uh, that Din is very favored in this game, it could turn out that some of those characters that Din needs in order to progress that win condition quickly are not... Um, not at the top of the deck because really it is only Tamatoa. Maybe there's a Maleficent there. There's a Judy Hopps that can quest for two. Everything else in the list actually quests for one. So a bit all in on trying to find this Tamatoa to progress the win condition quickly with the Lucky Dime. Lucky Dime hitting a one a one quest character like Madame Medusa. You could potentially get tempoed out by a Ruby Amethyst deck. That's particularly this is actually very interesting as we as we start to realize that there's there's no eight cost unnakable Sisus or right. something like that. That's what I think. It's it's an interesting decision by Din to not play the Sisus because although it does play as a great removal card into decks that are running lower strength characters, especially paired with the Ice Block, you're also removing a three lore character that you can hit with dime helps you finish those games a bit faster and Edmund is just occurring so much card advantage here with these rabbits bouncing them back and forth so many cards in hand can now potentially afford to expend resources at a sort of negative rate here against his opponent because his opponent just can't keep up with the card draws that the hair and flower shams every time they hit the field are immediately removed we're starting to see the power of ruby amethyst as it matches up into ruby sapphire yeah, and those Hiram Flavisham engines really are the uh, the bread and butter of these Sapphire Ruby decks, especially if you can't get a Tomatoa pulling back popsicles and drawing many cards. You eventually run into this situation where it's difficult to keep your hand full. You're constantly trying to answer cards on your opponent's side of the board, and if you can't make two-for-ones or three-for-ones regularly, then sometimes your hand can get too low. Wow, this is incredible. I think in the context of, of this match, in the context of... Din's deck, I actually think that Eden has turned the corner here now, is, is very, very favored. Because Din, even finding the Tomato off the top with so few items on the field, could lose to the pressure of Edmund, especially if you know, some of these goats are bounced back and forth. We could drop a castle. There's a be prepared. We're going to draw two cards off this. We have two triggers. We do find a Madame Mistake plus a friend on the other side. I just don't think that Din can keep up with the card advantage that's being accrued by Edmund. And usually that would be offset by the Lucky Dime because the Lucky Dime is sort of a win condition and it is very much an aggro card as you go into the late game and have all this ink. But Din just doesn't really have the targets outside of Tomatoa. And Tomatoa is only, is only going to be for... Um, potentially for three or four once it once it hits here. And something else to mention, you know, we talk about how strong cards like a Queen's Castle could be. If we see Edmund... Oh, triple! Three Queen's triple Castle. Queen's Castle! If we do this, let's say Din responds with a Tomato or something strong, Edmund's holding on to a uh, Be Prepared here. I don't think that I don't think that Din can do anything about this. Does have the Maui in hand, does have a Madame Medusa can do... And Maui can hit something, the, uh, the Vital Sphere can give something else Rush... But triple, that's 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 about as get, about as it gets. Yeah, that's that's a twelve ink play, and those have probably been sitting in hand for a long time, waiting for the for, waiting for the be prepared. That's like one of the best backup plans against <laughs> be prepared. Yeah, be prepared is not going to do anything. And even Edmund holding on to be prepared, anything that Din plays this turn can just be wiped if he tries yeah. to respond to this. Those Queen's Castles are representing six lore a turn, and over the course of the next two turns, Edmund's going to take game. So funny enough, Din actually has one of the better hands to deal with this. I think an additional Tomatoa in hand plus the Vitalsphere would be great 
because you could get, you could clear two of these, but he's going to going to be able to clear a singular castle. The problem is that as we go back over to Edmund's turn, Edmund does have a be prepared hand. It's going to clear both of those and can actually just walk these two castles to a win condition. And Dins expending two full cards to actually try you know very all in on like trying to get rid of these castles with D cards doesn't have much left in his hand to deal with it. So if we if we find a be prepared here off the back, which we know Edmund has, I think Dins in a really tough spot. Yeah, we also, uh, Edmund is holding on to that be prepared at the front of his hand in preparation. There is a dig a little deeper <laughs> in Din's hand. I don't expect that these, uh, that the Maui and the Queen of Hearts is going to last long enough to sing that card, uh, but would be interesting to potentially try to play to find an answer. Din has an enormous amount of ink, so might be able to even get this off and uh, find something to help him in any way. Maybe a Hercules. We're starting to see why Edmund came in so high in our Swiss bracket, coming in at second place. Just expert Ruby Amethyst play here from Edmund. Was looking very, very dire at the beginning with Din accelerating to so much ink and being so far ahead, but the, the corner has definitely turned. There is, there's not even a debate about it. Din is in trouble here. It looks like Din just inks return, passes, and it's going to go back to Edmund. I assume we're going to see this be prepared being played. And there it is, a B print. We're actually yeah. going to have a backup threat off off of it too. There's so much ink that Edmund has, being able to be prepared and it's a and goat. follow with a goat. And it's goat. And there's a bounce. We're going to go ahead and bounce that bounce that goat back. And we are looking, we're looking at game potentially on the next turn here because we're going to go up to 18. Then the goat plus another bounce, which we know is enhanced. A that's a modern mistake. Plus a goat is going to be game. Not even counting the quest value of this modern mim snake that is currently on the field. There's almost nothing that Din can do. I don't think that Din has enough ink to, even if he found the Tamatoa, it wouldn't be enough. Wow, how Edmund turned. I bet Ed Edmund was keeping those castles at hand for many, many turns. Was accruing so much card advantage, could keep them in hand, didn't have to ink them, and waited for the opponent to be forced into B-prepping the board, then dropped triple castle and change the entire narrative of this game very, very quickly. We do see Hercules. Hercules is a decent answer to this. Hercules can one-hit one of these one of these castles. Very, very relevant in this scenario. Yeah, so we'll dig a little deeper. Then we'll be able to look at the top, I believe, seven cards of his deck, choose two of them, and put into his hand. Finding the Hercules, which, as you said, is one of the better answers for Queen's Castle. Being able to immediately be played, have Rush and Reckless, has exactly seven strength, which is just the number of willpower on the Queen's Castle. And does for the Tamatoa, so the game is a little bit closer, but the Tamatoa needs to do about seven. <laughs> it needs to do about <laughs> 11. It needs to do about, like, he needs to gain the 11 more because I don't think we can, we're going to go through two turns of Edmund's turn. I do think that Edmund is not going to win the game on this turn, but it's going to get very, very close. I mean, this game is actually neck and neck. Oh, yeah. yeah just had to go. go bounce, and uh, it looks like Edmund is going to take that in the second game. Wow, so we went 14, 15, 16, 17. Wow. Yeah, so had the goat had the goat bounce goat, which is the three the three.